is so worthy to be praised. He is so worthy to be adored. If you would, turn with me to 2 Timothy 1 and 6. And as you're turning, I will pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you right now, God, for just another worship opportunity to be in your house, to be in your presence, God. Father, I ask that you continue to fill us up with your overflow, God, your knowledge, your wisdom, and your understanding, God. Father, I ask that you open our ears to be able to hear the voice of you, God, not even the voice of myself, Lord. I ask, so, oh God, that you continue to hide me behind your cross, Father, and you feel me mightily in you, God. Touch the man of God of this house, Father, like on only you can, Lord. And it's in your son Jesus' name that I thank you and I do pray, Father. Thank you, Lord, and amen. Second Timothy 1 and 6 says, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands, using as a title, shifting in your gift. Shifting in your gift. Over the course of this Shifting with God series, we have been taught how to shift in our minds and how to shift the atmosphere with our prayers. And we've even know how to shift into our purpose. But tonight we get to awaken our spirits on how to shift in our gifts. The book of 2 Timothy is a very personal letter that Paul was writing to Timothy while he was in prison awaiting his execution. And in this letter that Paul was writing to Timothy, Paul was encouraging Timothy to not allow even Paul's death to become a setback in Timothy's life. Paul wanted Timothy to know that as a true Christian, that as a person that leads other people to Christ, that as a person that's called to stand firm and safeguard in the gospel and spreading the message of salvation in Jesus Christ, there is no circumstance suitable enough to keep him from, from performing the work in which God had planted on the inside of Timothy to do. See, Paul understood that real ministry is not when the preference of life is standing by your side, but real ministry is when you demonstrate a real passion for God, Christ regardless of the circumstances surrounding you. See, Paul understood that Timothy had a real fire burning on the inside of him and that he couldn't allow Timothy to let the fire burn out of himself just because Paul would no longer physically be rolling with him. Paul knew that even following his death, the gift still had to be stirred up on the inside of Timothy. I will never forget when I was growing up that my brother brought my father this random ceramic dinosaur for Christmas one year. And every year before we would open our gifts, we all would laugh and tell my father that we hoped that he didn't get another one of these dinosaurs. But one thing that touched my spirit when I was preparing this lesson was that no matter how many years we laughed about it, no matter how 20 and 30 years had gone by and we were still laughing, we were still recognizing and acknowledging this same dinosaur that's even to this day still sitting on my father's dresser because it wasn't how much money my brother spent on the gift. It was about how the gift of love never lost its value because a gift should hold the ability to have la a lasting shift in your life. What this taught me is what, what good is a gift that only holds a day's value. When God can anoint a gift that holds dear to your heart for the duration of your life. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 7 and 7 that surely oppression maketh a wise man mad and a gift destroyeth the heart. This is why we have to be careful about gifts that bribe our flesh but corrupt and contaminate our souls because your gift should not make your flesh feel so good, but your gift should shift your spirit to effortlessly do the works of God that's in you to be good. Paul understood that his gift of being Timothy's mentor was bigger than just a title of a mentorship. Paul understood that he was responsible for making sure that Timothy could still walk, even when Paul could no longer hold Timothy's hand. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 22 and 6 to train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will never depart from it. It's a gift to impart something into another life that shapes and transforms their lives forever. This is why as mothers and fathers, God imparted a specific gift on the inside of us, designated to minister to our specific homes. That's why he assigned us 
de and designated us to our specified children that even could, even when they are no longer in our presence are even no longer that they're children anymore that we're able to hold their hand the anointing of our training would still be a part of their lives forever this is why God connects us with some folks that their words hold a great ordeal of power in our lives because it's just something about when God anoints the words of your mentor that it can replay over and over and over again in your head. This is why many people can testify on today that they can remember when their grandmama said something to them or they can remember when their grandfather told them something or they can remember when their mama told them to not do something or they can remember remember when their father showed them how to do something or they can just remember simply when their mentor told them to stay out of something and no matter how many days or months or even years pass by no matter how far the mentor is from your presence it's just something about their words that have been anointed with the gift to reel you back on track no matter where they physically are this is why Hebrews 10 and 25 tells us not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but ex exhorting one another. And so much the more as ye see the day approaching. See, it's something about the word that goes forth each and every service that holds a gift that should be able to stir up the gift that's on the inside of you. It should be something about the word that even if you don't get it from the pastor, it should be coming to you from the teacher. That even if it's not coming to you from the teacher, it should be able to come from you from the, from the evangelist. And even if it's not coming to you from the evangelist, some way it should have hit you from the minister. And if you didn't get it from one of the ministers, us. surely one of the reviewers touched something to stir something in your soul and if you didn't get it while you were in Sunday school going through the review it should be something about the worship service that manifested the gifts out of you it should be something about the fellowship when you come into the tabernacle that stirs up something inside of your soul no matter what entity of service it is it's all been anointed and designated to pull out something on the inside of you. On the game show, the price is right. You don't ever know when Bob Barker was going to call your name to come down, but it never stopped the audience from getting that fired up feeling that they might have been the next one. And when you come into the tabernacle, you never know when God is going to touch somebody to call on your name for you to be the one that has to come on down. So you already have to have a fire in your spirit to be able to receive that, he's that he would call you. See, we dare not reject the invitation to come when God has given you a gift to keep on coming. It's something about the assembly of the gathering that brings a word that cuts through all the depths of every circumstance that we're in. That's why people oftentimes tell Pastor Kina that the word did something that day that they felt changed their lives forever because it's just something about a gift that can stay in your life forever no matter what the gift is. It's something about the anointing of the word that has the ability to bring you down to your knees. It's just something about the gift of the anointing of the word that shifts your gift into a praise when you know it ain't no praise left in your body to do. It's just something about the gift of getting the word that will have you walked in with a bowed down head, but walk out with a turned around spirit because it's just something about the gift of the word that I have you crying on yesterday, but I never have you crying about the same thing on tomorrow because it's just something about the anointing of the gift that comes when it comes from the word that it draws all men unto thee this is why sister Adams taught last week that you can't have a rejectory spirit of who we want to see bringing forth the word because you never know which one of us God is going to use to bring that word to you so you have to be able to come in to receive a word in order to leave out with the gift of being edified for the word. Otherwise, the gift will continue to pass you by. Paul knew ahead of time 
that his death would devastate Timothy. So he had to make sure his words were anointed enough to keep the flame lit, to even burn through the pain of his devastation. This lets us know that even devastation is no excuse not to be on fire for God. For it was Jesus himself that said in Luke 9 and 62, and Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. See, God will not accept any excuse why you're not allowed to use, why you've allowed your gifts to become in disuse. So Paul wanted to make sure that he instilled in Timothy that no matter what it looked like and no matter what it was going to feel like and no matter what the people were talking around him that it sounded like, he better learn how to stir up his gift right because God was still looking at him to perform the gift that he put inside of him even when Paul was no longer mentoring him. Second Timothy 1 and 6 says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting of my hands. The word translated, stir up, is the Greek word, anazopreo, which contains the same, the same root as the English word, pyre, which den denotes to kindle afresh or to keep in full flame. If you've ever experienced a camping trip, one of the best parts is to sit around the bonfire roasting the marshmallows, enjoying your s'mores, or even roasting hot dogs to enjoy dinner with your family for the night. But one thing when you're camping that you'll notice is as the fire gets old and as the fire has burned for an extensive period of time, you'll begin to notice how the fire starts to dwindle down. And if it's not properly tended to, the fire will eventually burn out. So every now and then, when you're tending to a campfire, you've got to be able to st stir up the glowing embers of the dying fire in order to cause the embers to reignite a flame again and burn more brightly. So I don't know why, well, who today feels like they are just a dying fire on the inside of them or who feels like there is something that they feel like they're losing, that God is no longer and hearing them but God is telling you tonight that the fact that you have not died out is a major indicator that all you need is your embers restirred back up again because you got a glow on the inside of you you just need somebody to stir up the embers that are still glowing in you see we gotta stop allowing the cold situations in our lives to cause us to forget about the burning flames of, our, of the Holy Spirit that dwells deep down on the inside of us. See, just because life decided to turn its back on you doesn't give you the excuse to turn your back on God. See, just because life executed a few folks in your life, it doesn't mean that you can exe execute the gift of the Holy Spirit out of your life. See, you can't allow dead situations to stop you from shifting in your determination because death didn't even hold Jesus down. So why do we think it's acceptable for any excuse for us to be held down from having the flame of the fire that Jesus has put on the inside of us? Trials didn't hold Jesus. So why do we think it's an acceptable, acceptable excuse to hold us down? Because being talked about, being persecuted, didn't hold Jesus. So why do we think that God is going to accept the excuse that I don't feel like hearing the people talk about me so I no longer can be used? This is why Paul already had told us in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9, that we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. See, God is trying to let somebody know that it doesn't matter how much hell and high water is going on in your life. There is always a but to the situation because it doesn't matter how bad it may look. God already told you, but it ain't over. There's always a but to a situation. 
So God is not looking for any of our excuses. He's looking for us to shift in the gift that he gave us to use. It's a gift to be able to smile when you know that everything about your life is going under. See, it's a gift to still praise God when you ain't even got the strength to raise your hand. It's a gift to be able to get off the pool of sorrow in which you were once laying in when, when you know that tomorrow you still got to come and praise and worship the Lord. See, we live in a society where so many misunderstandings happen in the course of just one day. So it's a gift to be able to understand what God is trying to do in our lives. It's a gift to be able to understand when God is telling you to shift out of that bad situation. It's a gift to be able to understand when God is saying, if I gave you the gift, how dare you tell me you're not going to use your gift? So it's a gift to be able to understand God. See, you got to be able to understand God in order to really understand when God is trying to shift you into a new situation. Psalms 34 and 19 says, Many are the, are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. See, we got to stop wasting all this time in our lives having these pity parties for being afflicted when it's a gift to be afflicted. See, thieves don't break into homes and steal stuff because they don't have anything else to do. They break into homes to steal stuff because they saw some type of value when they seen you going through. See, the devil ain't coming to afflict none of us because we are busy playing with him all week. The devil is trying to afflict you to make the righteousness in you weak. The devil is not afflicting us because he doesn't have anything else to do. The devil is really afflicting us because he's trying to make a profit out of you. So if you're being right, and it allows God to afflict you for being right. You best believe that God's also got to grant the gift to shift you out right. Pastor Connor oftentimes testifies about how his sister told him that he would be dead at the age of 16 because his mouth was just that smart. And many of us still today can testify and say that we got a natural born attitude. It's nothing that anybody really had to do to make us decide today we gonna cock our head to the side. It's nothing really that anybody had to do to make us decide when they look at you, you gonna roll your eyes. It's really not very much when you got a bad attitude that somebody's got to do to make you just walk away like you ain't even see people in the room. See, it's nothing wrong. People with a bad attitude can text you a thousand and one words a minute when they trying to confront you. Because when you got a bad attitude, you just gonna bring the bad attitude out of you. But one thing that I realized is, people that got bad attitudes, and people that, that can roll their eyes so good, they perfected doing this with the saints. But yet, they've not perfected it doing it with the devil. See, you got to stop having an attitude with the person that's sitting on the side of you praying for you. And then when the devil is afflicting you, you ain't got no words to say to him. See, it's a gift. It's a gift to be able to shift the badness in our lives and be able to use it for the purpose in which we, we were edified to do. See, when the devil has offended us, you got to be able to use that same attitude, that same neck rolling, that same side eyeing, that same tight lipping, that same hand bobbing, that same backbiting, that same gossiping, that same lying, that same unchanged tongue. You got to be able to use that same attitude. To be able to get the last word in on the devil. See, you got to be able 
to cock your head sometimes on the devil and let him know that I know that you thought that I was going to stay afflicted. But see, the God that I serve already let me know that I was going to get shifted. See, it's a gift and knowing how to shift. But you got to be able to know when it's time to shift. Because Proverbs 24 and 16 says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. See, no matter how much time, no matter how much effort, no matter how much money, no matter what you do for a mischievous person, nothing will ever be good enough. See, no matter what you do for a mischievous person, they still going to find some more mischief because no matter what you do for the mischievous person, they ultimately got a devil inside of them. So it doesn't matter how many, what you do, so you cannot take the mischief out of a fool. See, there ain't nothing you can do to bring a wicked person back. Oh, oh, but when you are a just man, you got to be able to let the devil know sometimes. Ain't no need in you to start gloating on my downfall. Ain't no need in you to start gloating because you see me laying there. Ain't no need to start gloating because you didn't see me around for a little while. Because the Bible already told me that I got six more times to get back up. See, sometimes, even more than once, your enemies are going to see you fall. But the gift is though they saw you fall, they still got to stand there and watch you get back up. See, you got to shift. You got to know that it's a gift to be able to shift six more times. See, we got to stop letting the devil think that just because he falls, he forgot about the six times that God told us that we were able to get back up. This is why we have to serve God in gladness. This is why you got to even serve God with your sadness. This is why you got to serve God when things are up and you got to serve God when things are going bad because the gift of shifting only keeps on growing when you stay in the presence of God. James 1 and 17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and coming down from the Father of lights and whom is no variables, neither shadow of turning. See, God makes no mistakes. Therefore, if he put it in you, he planned for it to come out of you. And if he brought it out of you, he never cut the volume off to turn it off of you. So therefore, just because you chose to walk out, God said he never burnt the gift out. God doesn't grant us gifts for us just to sit around on our gifts. See, we can't want the blessings in life, but we choke up on the lessons of life. See, we can't See, they'll get the gift of the rainbow, but we hold our heads down when it's time to walk through a storm. See, we can't have a gift that we've got the ability to teach, but when life is wearing us out, we turn our backs on the people that God intended for us to reach. See, there's no way that God put a gift on the inside of you just for you to turn your back on the gift that he gave you. See, one thing I love about when Pastor Connor was teaching about the shifting of gears, is he said weeping doesn't endure. Weeping doesn't have to endure for a night if you know how to shift right. So you got to understand that the average person cannot drive a stick shift. Most of us have to drive automatics. So the gift in being able to shift is a gift within itself. This is why you have to shift in your gifts that God has instilled in you. Because just like I said, most people have to drive an automatic. So God didn't grant that shifting ability for everybody to be able to shift out of the situations that they in. So if we decide that we don't want to shift no more, it's a whole lot of people on the other side that God didn't give that shift ability that he can bless with the shifting that we have. Because if you don't use your gifts, 
the fire will eventually burn through your gifts. It's a gift to be able to upshift through every circumstance. It's a gift to know that yesterday I was depressed, but today I'm still praising the Lord. See, it's a gift to be able to upshift so that you can zoom past all the problems that you know are trying to come up against you. It's a gift to be able to upshift from poverty, and then tomorrow you walk in prosperity. See, it's a gift to be able to shift and to have a real spirit to wait on the Lord and not walk with a spirit of expectancy. It's a gift to be able to have a spirit of true patience and not keep pointing out to God that I'm patiently waiting because God already said, if you are patient, I've already seen you. So I don't need you to acknowledge anybody but me, not anything that you're doing for me. It's a gift to follow the voice of God when man's voice is telling you that you look like a fool. See, it's a gift to be able to build the boat. Even when you looked at every app on your phone and knew that it wasn't no rain in the forecast. But it's still a gift to be able to trust God in the shift and what she's about to do for you. It's a gift to be able to bounce back up. It's a gift to be able to come back every setback that you faced in your life. There's a gift in being able to survive a text and be able to tell somebody what you survived. You just got to be able to recognize you have a gift and the ability to shift. This is why the Bible tells us in Proverbs 18 and 26, a man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. Pastor Connor once said that your gift is your ministry. There's a gift in being able to do you like nobody else can do you. See, Pastor Connor and Sister Adams oftentimes testify about how Pastor Connor was just a mere man with the gift of a plan. And Sister Adams oftentimes testifies how she just was a mere woman with the gift of administration. But one thing that I love about, about their story is no matter how much the man of God admires the woman of God, he knows that he can never do her better than she can do her. And she knows that no matter how much she admires, admires him the, she will never be able to do him better than he can do him because what they both understand is God connect God never connected them together so that they could become one another God connected them together so that they could shift the gifts in one another they didn't use their gifts trying to compete or be one another they allowed their gifts to make room for them in order to collaborate, to, be, to build a kingdom that's undefeatable with one another. So you got to have the right folks on your team to shift your gifts of righteousness when God is, decides to show up on the scene. Sister Latanya testified a couple of weeks ago about how she was so discouraged in her spirit to the point she had to sit in the bathroom just to be able to put herself back together because she went from having stability to being in a situation of unsurety. But because the woman of God had a gift to be able to shift some things up out of her life in just one stroke, God dried her weeping eyes and turned her no money situation into a shifting of unexpected checks popping into her bank account. See, when you have a gift, to shift yourself, yourself out of the meltdowns of sorrows in your life. God has a gift to shift you back into the promise that he promised you of tomorrow. Because like David, when you can encourage yourself in the Lord, God can encourage himself back into you. All he wants you to do is use your gift to shift him back into stirring up the gifts that lie on the inside of you. See, when you know how to shift right, God can prepare your way right. This is why he says in Proverbs 16 and 7, 16 and 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Sister T Tiffany shared a powerful testimony a couple of weeks ago 
about how she was so over this lady on her job to a point that she began to pray that either God moved her or God had to move the lady. And, and little did Sister Tiffany know that later on in life, God had been already using the gifts of Sister Tiffany's spirit on the very woman that she thought couldn't stand her. See, God was able to move the lady off Sister Tiffany's job. But what Sister Tiffany didn't know is when God was ready to shift her to the next level, the very woman that she thought hated her was now her biggest advocator. See, God has a way. God has a way of making you even forget about all the haters that you have in your life. This is why we can never get so caught up in the moment on who hates us that we forget to delight our ways in the Lord. Because if Sister Tiffany never kept on praying, God would have never kept on working. And if she would have never kept on praying, when it was time for her to move to the next level with the same woman that she had to pray for, she wouldn't have had nobody to say, I need a Sister Tiffany in my life. Because God was already working on the woman's spirit because Tiffany had a gift to be able to shift even when she didn't know that she was shifting. So you can never get so caught up in the moment of who hates you because when God, just like God has a way of preparing a way for you through your gifts, he also has a way of turning all of your haters into your number one fans. See, you thought that one time they was your rivals, but then when you look on the sidelines, you see they the cheerleading team. So you got to be able to say, God, I know that you already said that my enemies would be my footstools. So I just got to wait on the moment when I can step over them to keep getting my shift in through. See, you always have to remember not to lean unto your own understanding because God already said in all your ways to acknowledge him. In all your ways to acknowledge him. In everything that you do, you got to acknowledge him. So if I'm busy acknowledging, there's no way that I'm worried about who's hating. So you got to allow him to take over the shifting of your plans and stop trying to change the gears for yourself. Because Daniel had a gift to stand firm when he was in the lion's den, that even when he was wrongfully accused, he never tried to do a match to match, fault to fault. He never tried to have somebody to be able to say, oh, they threw me in the lion's den, so why don't you throw them back? He never had a woe is me spirit to say, God, why don't you take them out? He never had a spirit to say, I see you doing it, for the, I see you let them out of the den. How come I'm still stuck in the den. He stood firm. And because he stood firm, God was able to shift him out of a situation that no man could have took him out of. See, he didn't try to take nobody down with him. He didn't try to pull as many people as he could with him. He didn't try to make people think that they owed him for throwing him in the lion's den. He didn't try to make people feel sorry when he got out. He thanked God and walked his way out. He thanked God and never looked back. So God was able to shift him out of the lion's den. Joseph was just, was just a man that was born with a gift destined to fulfill a dream. But because he didn't even allow being thrown in the pit by the people that were supposed to love him the most to even to allow them to throw him off his course of following God's plans. So God was able to prepare a way through Joseph, through his gift of being patient. Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving and the gift that keeps on living. Yet he used his gift to love all of us, to walk his own walk, to get on his own cross, to take on all of our sins, to be nailed in his hands, to be nailed in his feet, to be, to be able to wear a crown of thorns pierced in his head. This is why Jesus went to the cross 42 generations so that we could have the power, the unction, the function, the fire, and the ability to keep on shifting in your gifts. 